Hey guys, Matt here. Today, getting back into a look into the Psalms. I love the Psalms. I love the poetry in the Bible. It's, it's so precious. Uh, today we're going to look at some, some themes that we see throughout the Psalms. And last time we looked at one of the Psalms, I think we looked at Psalm 1, and we talked about how maybe some people read that as if it's written to and about them. And I've done that myself. You know, you read it and you say, I'm the blessed man, I'm the one who loves the law, and I delight in the law. But there's only one blessed man, Jesus. That's why in Luke 24, Jesus says, all the Psalms, all the prophets, all the law is written about me. What he's saying is the entire Old Testament has written about me. Now, it's not always about this, written about Christ in the same way. So what our job is, is to wrestle it out. How is this pointing to Christ and or the gospel event and or the need for the Christ, you could say. So when we read the Psalms, we have to read that with that in our mind that this is about Jesus. I don't know how yet, but we're going to get there by, by studying through this. It's not written about David. He's not the blessed man. He's not the one who meditates on the law. Uh, it's not written about me. And when we go into a book like the Psalms or, or any uh, prophecy or any even revelation, apocalyptic, revelatory uh, books, we're not supposed to read them the same way we read narrative books. I think people get in trouble doing that. Uh, we get all kinds of different eschatological ideas on the end times by reading things literally that are not supposed to be read literally. Are we supposed to exegete them literally? Yeah. In other words, we're supposed to pull out the meaning, what the author is saying, but we don't take everything literally. Uh, take Revelation. A lot of people set down an eschatological timeline because they see the thousand years. But is a thousand years ever meant literally in Scripture? I don't think so. The, the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You've heard that verse, right? The Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Does that mean the cattle on the thousand and tenth hill are owned by Farmer Jones? No, it means the Lord owns the cattle on every hill. A thousand is just a really big number. Uh, how about this one? Better is one day in your court than a thousand elsewhere. Are we supposed to surmise from that that a thousand and twenty-five days elsewhere would somehow trump one day with the Lord? That's not what it means at all. A th better is one day with you, Lord, than any amount of time anywhere ever. That's what the author is saying. So a thousand doesn't literally mean a thousand. We need to read them properly. And it's the same way with the Psalms. We don't read the Psalms literally. We exegete them literally. I think maybe it would be helpful if I gave one more example. Let's say there's a husband and wife. Okay, Husband and wife get in a fight. Husband writes the wife a letter. And he says, honey, ever since our fight, my heart's been broken into a million pieces. Now, is the wife supposed to take that letter literally? Next time she sees her husband, is she going to say, you lied to me. Your heart's not literally broken into a million pieces. Of course she's not going to say that. She's a reasonable person. She read it as if, or she pulled out the context. She pulled out the heart of it, right? He's hurting. Item number two, let's say husband's car breaks down uh, in a certain city. He sends his wife a text and he texts her the, the directions. Now, is she going to read the text different than she read the letter? Of course, she's going to read it literally. I'm literally going to go and I'm literally going to turn left on 101st and right on 72nd Avenue, etc., etc., Two different genres of communication from the same person. That's what God's Word is like. We're not supposed to read apocalyptic, prophetic, uh, parallel poetry. We're not supposed to read that literally. We're supposed to exegete it literally. So, with that in mind, uh, let's look at just a couple of, couple of common themes I've seen in the Psalms, and just want to talk about them briefly, and then we'll run through a Psalm, okay? So, I think there's 10 or 11 that I notice. One, let me run through them real quick, and then I'll, I'll take you to a place in the Psalms where we can see this. Number one, there's a suffering servant. He's suffering. It's not David. 
And it's not me. There's a suffering servant. Two, he's suffering for sins. That's going to challenge us. We'll get to that in a minute. Three, these sins are not his own, though they are being charged to him as if they're his own. Four, he's perfect. He's a perfect law keeper. Not David. Not me. He's a perfect praiser of Yahweh. He's always in communion with Yahweh. He cries things like, Deal with me according to my righteousness. No one else could ever say that, right? He's the perfect fearer of God. He's always under attack by those who are supposed to recognize and love him. And as he calls to his father, his father always answers him and gives him two things. Gives him his steadfast love and gives him deliverance. Let's, let's break these down real quick. We're not going to spend a lot of time on them. Suffering servant. Let's just take a look at an example of this, and it's everywhere in the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 5, verse 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for you do I pray. He's crying out to God. Right? He's suffering and crying out to God. Same thing in, in Psalm 22. Uh, oh my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from the, the cry of my heart? There's a suffering servant and he's suffering. He's suffering for sins, but the sins aren't his own. Okay, let's. what do we do with that? Let's take a look at something. Psalm 40, verse 12, and this is going to stretch you, maybe. But remember, we don't read poetry the same way we read narrative. And I'm going to give you a, a prime example of that here. Psalm 40, verse 12. Here's what he says. This is Jesus. Not David. This is Jesus. He says, For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me that I cannot see. Okay. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Wait a minute. That's troubling. Jesus never sinned, right? Right. Jesus never sinned. This is the poetic way of saying what the narrative says in 2 Corinthians 5.21. In other words, my iniquities have overtaken me is the poetic way of saying he who knew no sin became sin that we could become the righteousness of God. Two different genres. One's narrative, one's poetry. Think of it this way. If this verse, my iniquities have overtaken me, but then there was a comma in parentheses, although they're not my iniquities because I am Jesus and I'm perfect, and then he went on and on and on, would that completely kill the poem? It would. He's trying to evoke an emotion. He's trying to show us that although he was 100% God, he was also 100% man, and he really did sin, and he really did, or he really did suffer. He didn't sin. He really did suffer, but he felt sin. He felt the weight of it. It was horrid, and we need to own that. We need to hold on to that and feel that. That's what poetry does. When, when the author says, the Lord will smash them with a rod of his hand, a rod of iron, it's the same way as saying, deal with them according to your wrath. But which one packs a greater punch? The Lord will strike them with a rod of iron. Now, that one does, right? That's what he's trying to do. That's what parallelism, that's what poetry does. It's artistic. It, it paints a picture and it's supposed to draw us in and feel the weight of what's going on. So, he never sinned, but he's being charged with sin. And so when we see verses like this, we're supposed to think, ah, but he who knew no sin became sin, so that we could become the righteousness of God. That's what he's saying. Uh, so that was number three. Number four, he's perfect. He's perfect. He's a perfect law keeper. We saw that in Psalm 1, didn't we? Psalm 1, he meditates on the law. He loves the law. You could say because he meditates on the law and he loves the law, he fulfills the law, right? Matthew 5, 17, 18, 19. So let's take a look at Psalm 119 because that's another one where we often read and we romanticize in our heart and we say, I am that guy. I'm the one who delights. I meditate on it. Oh, I love your law. But there's only one who really does that, and it's Jesus. Look at how Psalm 119 starts. He says, 
Blessed are those whose way is blameless, Jesus, nobody else can say their way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Nobody walks in the law of the Lord except one, Jesus. Right? Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. Uh, you could go all over the place. Verse 33, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep them to the end. Only Jesus can say that. So, uh, verse 55, I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and keep your law. Only one person keeps his law, and it's Jesus, right? It's not us. It's not King David. King David couldn't keep the law. Uh, even if you took away Bathsheba and Uriah, King David died, as it says in Acts, and his soul saw corruption, just like everyone else, but not Jesus, right? There's only one perfect law keeper, and it's Jesus. So, he's a suffering servant, suffering for sins, a sinner on his own. He's perfect. He's the perfect law keeper. Number five, he's a perfect praise giver to Yahweh. We see that all over the place. Uh, again, I'll, I'll just go to Psalm 5, but it's all over the place. He's the perfect prayer, the perfect praiser to Yahweh. Psalm 5 says, ta -ta 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 -ta. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice of praise. What does God want? He doesn't want bulls and goats. He wants your heart. But only one person could truly do that. Only one person was the perfect law keeper, the perfect prayer, the perfect praiser, and it's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. He's the perfect fearer of God. Just think about this. You know how it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? Who is the perfect fear of God? Who is the original fear of God? It's Jesus. Psalm 5, verse 7. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down towards your temple in fear of you. Remember in Deuteronomy 17 when Moses prophesies, you're going to want a king, you're going to ask for a king, and this king is going to write for himself a copy of the law approved by the Levitical priests, and he's not going to put himself above his brothers. Jesus calls us brothers, right? Uh, Psalm 22, Hebrews 2, and he will fear the Lord. Jesus, the perfect law keeper, the perfect fearer. Number nine, he's always under attack even from those whom are supposed to love him. He's always under attack. Look at Psalm 7, verse 1. O Lord, my God, in you do I take refuge. Why does he need refuge? Because he's under attack. Save me from all your pursuers and deliver me, lest, like a lion, they tear my soul apart, rendering it into pieces with none to deliver. He also says this in, in Psalm 41, verse 9. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Obviously, he's talking about Judas. He's always under attack by everyone who's in sin, even those who he came to save first, the Jews. Number 10, as he calls on his father, this is a, this is a, beautiful, this is a beautiful one, as he calls on his father, his father always hears him and always gives him steadfast love and delivers him. Okay, so you'll see these common themes all the time. Suffering servant, crying out, crying out for sins. He's, he's suffering for sins that, that are not even his sins. He's suffering from his own people and people that don't know him, right? People that are supposed to know him. And then the others, all of which don't really know him. He's always crying out to God. He's the perfect praiser of God. He's the perfect prayer to God. He's the perfect law keeper. He's the perfect fear. And because of that... Yahweh always hears him and always gives him something called steadfast love. He always gives him steadfast love. Uh, we'll look at that in a minute. He always hears him, he always gives him steadfast love, and he always delivers him. And this is the exciting part of the suffering servant's journey. Think of Psalm 22. 
He goes from, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by night, but you do not answer, and by day I find no rest. He goes on to say, I am like a worm. They mock me. They wag their head at me. They're like the bulls of Bashan. They're like roaring lions. He goes on and on and on, and it sounds hopeless until he gets to verse 21. He says, Save me from the mouth of the lion, part B. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. You have rescued me. Why does Yahweh rescue him? Because he's his begotten son. He's the perfect one. And what happens immediately after he's rescued? This is rule number 11. Then and only then can we find our way in the Psalms. Then and only then. We can't circumvent the gospel and say, the Psalms all about me. No. We only find our way after the suffering one is delivered and we're invited in his deliverance. Verse 22, as soon as he's rescued, as soon as God rescues him from the horns of the wild oxen, are they literally wild oxen? No. As soon as God rescues, rescues Jesus from the cross, as soon as he resurrects him, he says in verse 22, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. See the term brothers? After his deliverance, all those whom he chooses, and he does the choosing, not us, all those whom he chooses then come in and praise the Lord. Those are the common rules and the common themes we see throughout the Psalms. And just so we can see them kind of in action, they're not always going to have the same ones exactly. I'm just going to run through Psalm 5 kind of quickly. And then in the next couple of days, we'll do it a couple other, with a couple other psalms. Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my groaning. He's crying out. He's suffering. Verse 2. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for you do I pray. He's praying to his Father. Verse 3. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. Mark 1. Early in the morning, Jesus goes to a desolate place to pray to his Father. He's always praying and in communion with his Father. Verse 4, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Now he points to a group of people who are not like him at all. You're not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. Transition, verse 7, But... But I, but I'm not like them, the suffering servant says. But I, how? How am I going to not be like them? How am I going to get my deliverance? But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love. Because he's the perfect praiser, the perfect law keeper, the perfect fear of Yahweh, because he's always in communion, Yahweh hears and gives him something. And the something he gives him is called steadfast love. And it's a beautiful thing. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down towards your holy temple in fear of you. He's the perfect fear of God. Deuteronomy 17. The perfect fear, the perfect king. Verse 8. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me, crying out in his humanity, being surrounded by enemies. Verse 9. Now this is interesting. For there is no truth in their mouth. Who is he talking about? He's talking about the enemies of God. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsel. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out. For they, they've rebelled against you. This is interesting. Because if we want to read ourselves into the psalm too soon, this is where we would be. This is what Paul quotes in Romans 3, verse 10 through 18 or 19. He says, None are righteous, no, not one. All have sinned, all are wicked. Their throats are like an open grave. This is where he gets it from. Psalm 5, verse 9. Where are we apart from the blessed man, apart from the perfect king, apart from the suffering servant, apart from his deliverance? We're in verse 9. 
Our mouths are like an open grave. Think about walking by a grave with a dead man who's been sitting in there for 8 days, 10 days, 15 days. The stench that would come from that grave, that's you and me apart from him. Verse 11, but let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Ah, now comes the good news. Let all who take refuge in you rejoice. After the servant is delivered, we can take refuge, right? But let all who take refuge in, in you rejoice. Let them sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exult in you. Verse 12, for you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him, Jesus, with favor as with a shield. So you see that, you see that all the time there's a suffering servant, he's suffering for sin, the sins aren't his own, he's perfect. Perfect law keeper, perfect praiser, perfect prayer, perfect fear, perfect communion with the Father. And the Father, because of his perfection, delivers him and gives him steadfast love. And after the deliverance come the followers. Those are the themes that we must see in the Psalms, and it's okay to read them as poetry and not read them literally, but exegete them literally. It's okay. Jesus never sinned, but we need to read them properly. They're not written about me. They're not written about David. They're written about our King, and we need to be in Him to be delivered. Peace.